Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are in the world, and welcome to the Sales Players Podcast. Hey everybody, this is uh, David Craig White, your host here on the Sales Players Podcast, as per usual. And today I'm joined by Owen Richards, founder and CEO of Air Marketing, which is a B2B lead generation agency in the UK. Uh, Owen, thanks for joining us. And maybe you can do it a bit more justice than I did about introducing uh, what, who you are and where you're from. Mm, I think you did a pretty good job, to be fair. Um, yeah, as you say, I'm Owen Richards and the Founder and CEO of Air Marketing, we're an outsourced, um, I guess, revenue acceleration agency is a good way to call it nowadays. So uh, on the one side of our business, we we provide outsourced SDR services or prospecting services. And on the other on the other side, marketing and demand gen. So, you know, right across the right across the go to market mix to try and drive revenue opportunities into our clients pipeline. Excellent. Excellent. All right, cool. And the reason why sort of I invited you on today, uh, Owen, and uh, so everybody else knows you've got expectations about what we'll cover today um, is because, because number one, you've been in my LinkedIn feed. I think we connected at some point last year. Um, or I've at least seen your company in my LinkedIn feed a lot. Mm. So you're doing something right on a social <laughs> side. That sure. um, and it's also like it gives a bit of diversity, I think, because, because I think you, you've got a sales background, of course, mm. but you've also done a lot in leadership and I, I I've got a feeling as well you're going to be able to share quite a bit with us as well in regards to leadership and entrepreneurship to a certain degree, um, which are three things I know sort of, you know, the audience are quite interested in in general when you're in sales. So so it should be fun. So as per usual, I will uh, start from the beginning and share with us sort of where before you got into sales, what was you doing? Where did you come from? Did you study and, and where was it and how did you end up in sales? What What's your sales story? Yeah, um, went to university in London um, and had no idea what I wanted to do, what I wanted to be. Just knew that I that I enjoyed spending a lot of time in the uni bar and probably not enough time in lectures. Um, but you know, I was definitely a lifestyle university attendee, not a uh, not a you know not 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 determined to go and get my first. That's for sure. Um, had a lot of fun. Left university, still didn't know what I wanted to do um went traveling to australia for a year and fell into sales got a, a what would now be called an sdr role but in those days it was a tele sales agent um uh, job for a small start startup outsourced tele sales agency um yep. and started trying to book meetings for clients in the b2b space uh, i had had a, a little exposure to sales in my sixth form pre going to university where i used to do three evenings a week for about two months phoning people that hadn't really filled in a survey but telling them they'd filled in a survey to <laughs> win a holiday and that they'd actually won a holiday to get them into a room where obviously later some people that were far less honest than me were probably selling time shares or something like that but <laughs> i was 17 i knew no better um and i remember doing that and thinking oh i'm right at this um so that was i guess what led me into the newspaper ad in, in Manly in Australia that said part-time tele sales agents required when I first landed in Australia and yeah, I went and interviewed at, at Forest Marketing Group, who, who ironically are now investors in my business. So started with them in 2000, end of 2007. And the, the owner of that business is now my business partner, however, yeah. 15 years on. So um, yeah, absolutely, absolutely fell into it when I was traveling in Australia and Ended up staying there for seven and a half, eight years. So had a great journey, but like nice. people, sales was never the intention necessarily. Yeah, nice. And I, I did notice as well in your history, sort of, that there's, there's some connection with current and former employee there. Mm. Um, I, I noticed as well, sort of, you, you sort of went pretty rapidly into your first sales job, um, and then you was all of a sudden managing a team of twenty sales reps. So yeah. talk, talk about that, that sort of journey there. What, how, how was that? How did you end up uh, doing that so quick? Um, I think it's just right time, right place, right attitude in many ways. Yeah. Um, so Richard, who's my business partner over in Oz and still the MD of the, of the company in Australia, was at a stage where he was a year into business, maybe a bit more um, when I joined, probably looking for that person to go and take the step up to run the team so that he could grow the business. Um, yeah. 
and uh, you know, I, I happen to land in the, the, the environment at the right time and do do enough of the right things to stand out, I suppose. And that was two thousand and eight. And at the time, I was a you know a year out of graduation from university. The global financial crisis took its toll, and I remember, for example, the football team I was a part of in London before going out to Oz. Over fifty percent of them were unemployed, redundant, not able to find jobs, and we had this choice of. Do I stay in Australia and take this opportunity, or do I come back and, and, and face yeah. London and, and see if I can make it work? And it was a bit of a no-brainer. So when they said, "Hey, look, we'd love you to, to take a step up and prove yourself and offer the sponsorship to stay in Australia, so a, a visa that allows you to stay there whilst you're working there," uh, yeah, I bit the hand off. So um, funny because at 22, 23 years old, like you say, I was running a, a fairly sizable inside sales team. Um, I don't think age plays, you know, age is a funny one, isn't it? Because I think you, 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 you are the person you are at the time. I think I felt like I was probably mature enough to do it. And <laughs> I look back the and think, God, what did I do those things? But, you know, I was probably just the, 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 the best of a bad bunch at the time, I think is a nice way of putting it. <laughs> no, but I think it's a, it's a good example of like, especially when you work in, in like a startup space or you enter a startup, like, Everybody knows, I, I mean, I've worked with tech startups for 15 plus years now, and it does give you great opportunities, what you typically wouldn't get in another kind of company. Um, and I think that's that's one of those, if you're a bit of a risk taker and you, you're prepared to take the lot, play the lottery, if you like, mm -hmm. with a startup, you can get a bit lucky sometimes and, and yeah. land that right one there. So it's um, it's, yeah. it's, it's good good proof in the pudding again that, that mm -hmm. it is, yes, it is about timing, but sales is about timing in general. It is, right, you, so. know, you know, it's like, it's like anything, you get the breadth of experience you get in that environment compared to playing in one lane in a bigger organization yeah. is and has been invaluable for me. So, you know, yeah. I highly recommend it for people for sure. Yeah, yeah. I think that's also why so, some people struggle to adapt when they go the other way. If they've worked mm. in a big corporate, try to come and work in a startup, it's yeah. sometimes a bit of a reality yeah. check for them, right? It yeah. doesn't always think, why are things going? Why are things going wrong? Why are things not just working in front of me? Yeah, I always joke. I always joke about I, when I used to interview candidates. I used to look at the CV, see where they come from, and set expectations of like, do you know those Instagram pictures or Facebook or LinkedIn? What you see about pe when people post when they start a new job on the first day? There's that nice little symmetrical picture with the MacBook and the pen and everything. Mm -hmm. so that doesn't happen in a startup. <laughs> so it's always always good to set those expectations. Then they've got a little bit of an idea what it's going to be like, right? It's yeah. Like you might be looking for a keyboard on your first day somewhere. <laughs> so good. Yeah, yeah. So, all right, cool. So, talk to us about sort of that that transition there, uh, going so quickly into sales, doing some sales, proving yourself, and then shifting into managing a team, like, you know, the hiring, developing people, just managing a team of salespeople mm. in general. That's that's a challenge for even an experienced person. Mm. Do you remember some of those earlier sort of memories? What, what did you struggle with at first? What was the most difficult thing for you at first to try and get used to? Yeah, I, I do remember it quite well. Um, I, I think I, I think finding mechanisms to, to make decisions when you have to say no to people was one of the things I found hardest. So I am by very by my nature somebody who likes to be liked, somebody who wants to be friends with people. I am I'm extroverted. I'm, I get energy from people. I'm naturally very positive, and that kind of doesn't always play well when you've got to say no to people or reject people or let go of people um or work in a sales leadership role many would say yeah exactly so i think what i was really strong at naturally was the positive energizing coaching getting the great stuff out of people what i was not so good at was dealing with the tough bits um mm. and that's a skill i had to learn and i had to i guess consciously coach myself or be coached on again look for people to help me with it find mechanisms to work through that and it still goes against the grain to some degree, although it's become much more natural. But, you know, I think yeah. in those days, probably didn't have the emotional maturity to know what I was dealing with or, or, or how to get over those barriers. So, you know, I can remember some really tough conversations that I probably approached nowhere near as well as I would nowadays. Um, and that was certainly one of the hardest hurdles for me. And I think yeah. just generally a lack of commercial maturity. You, you don't know what you don't know when you're 22, 23 years old. And um yeah i was thrown in the deep end in a startup the mechanisms for helping me develop were learn on the job um and that's a great people to work with and learn with but you only learn as much as you've got in front of you and and, and yeah. 
you know, there's certainly some things I wish I knew back then that that um, that I certainly didn't. So yeah, it was an interesting journey. But I think that 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 piece for me was the hardest: learning how to say no, learning how to be tough on people, learning how to deal with conflict, have difficult conversations was not yeah. something that was was natural to me. The leadership fun stuff, I got that. That's fine. That was, yeah. that was natural for me. That yeah. stuff, not to be that. But yeah, I, I've got there. Yeah, yeah. So you mentioned then, I'll, and I'll, I'll cover them now while we're here. Um, like, what were those things? What you would would have done differently, or wish you would have had the knowledge of knowing certain things um, if you was to roll that? Yeah, look, there's always operational things. I think um, if I look back at some of the mistakes that that stick with me from those early days, what I didn't do, I certainly hired too many people that I liked, um, not necessarily people that that, um, that that had the right skill set. Um, I didn't, uh, how do I put this? I didn't bring people in that were better than me at things. I brought people in that I could afford. And I think in hindsight, I could have, um, and probably should have brought experts in a lot earlier um, yeah. and surrounded my, myself with people who, were, who, who were, would allow me to learn from them and would push me and stretch me. Um, and that was just the nature of the business and where we are and the way that we made decisions. It doesn't, it doesn't mean, doesn't mean we consciously did that. It's just, you know, in hindsight, that's that's yeah. something we look back on and think, oh, I wish I'd have done that sooner. And what what ended up happening as a result is I ended up a, a bottleneck for that business. Everything and anything came through me eventually. Yeah. And that was because we didn't have good enough people. Uh, we're great human beings, but not skilled and experienced enough to take on and some of that. And, and then delegation became an issue. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I think it's 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 around that sort of how do you bring good people into the business? How do you structure the business? I think what we did was fly by the seat of our pants and made decisions as we went along. Um, yeah. Whereas you know, second, third time round now, I'm thinking a year, two years ahead and thinking about what are the roles that we need? What does that person look like? And I guess you're far more prepared to pay what you need to pay to bring the right people in because you learned that lesson. Yeah, and again, it's another it's another classic cliche of a startup, right? Um, you well, always on a shoestring in the beginning. Um, I, th I think it's also a case of like, because when you're first doing it, you're kind of like, yes, you've got a budget and you're unsure if it's going to work. Because mm. sometimes you don't even know, sometimes you don't have a product market fit yeah. or you don't know how much you can sell for. So it's mm -hmm. so many unknowns. So you don't want to take that risk of buying an expensive asset, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so you kind of like, let's get some cheap ones and we can test it out and see how it goes but then like you said it becomes that scalability problem right because yeah. you get beaten pretty quick mm. and when you can't delegate and you don't have the right people around you then of course yeah that just drowns you eventually so yeah it's... and you know you said about the shoestring i think you, you hit the nail on the head for us when i think back about that we, we stayed on a shoestring probably beyond when we needed to um because yeah. we were just in that mode we were just working yeah. slogging our guts out working 60 70 80 hour weeks and yeah. used to doing it um and yeah, kind of convincing ourselves that we couldn't gamble to the next level. We grow very quickly, but I think we missed a lot of opportunities in that period. Yeah. Was it complete bootstrap then? All self-funded kind of stuff? Yeah. 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 At, that, at that particular time, like you said, when it was going through recession, you're not going to get any funding very quickly. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. And it's, a, you know, what we do is a service business. We're not, we have a product. It's not, yeah. it's not the kind of sector, not. you know, if you're going to get, if you're a VC firm or, or whatever, Trust me, my industry is not going to be where you're going to be putting your money. You're going to go and find a nice. Oh, you, oh no, you, to pump it into. no, you you can always use PowerPoint and just make a mock up of some sort of tech. Oh yeah, so adding yeah. It onto the service thing. Yeah, you know, is it nice? <laughs> <laughs> I think we just missed that boat for the last 10 years. Uh, now, it's, yeah, now it's stopping yeah, again, right? Yeah, it's down. <laughs> yeah. All right. So you talked about um, your level of enthusiasm and the part what you're good at. And uh, that was mm -hmm. one thing I wanted to cover with you today as well, because I mean, I've managed sales teams. Um, I've hired, I've recruited, I've done mm -hmm. talent development. I've done a lot of that stuff. Um, and, you know, managing SDRs mm -hmm. compared to managing like full, full cycle sales reps, account yeah. execs and so on, very different jobs, right? Mm -hmm. Very different jobs. Uh, I don't know how much experience you've had of doing the full thing. You've, yeah. um, no, doubt, no doubt you've already got that in your business right now. Mm -hmm. But the SDR piece in particular, I think is probably more challenging mm -hmm. than, than it is. Well, it has its different challenges, right? And I think mm -hmm. one of those is that motivation. It is how do you keep these guys who do 
the hardest job in sales, 1000%. I always say the yeah. same thing. Like they have the hardest job in sales. Mm. How do you keep them motivated? How do you keep them sort of adapting and adjusting and remaining competitive? And yeah, I'm really, really interested in sort of what, what's your take on that? Yeah, it's interesting. And, and you know, it, it, going back to the most, more recent part of my career, it's one of the things that I've learned, um, you know, in the last few years is that transition from managing what might be deemed to be fairly junior people at the early stage of their career to managing senior leaders. And as a CEO, yeah. the, the business has grown to 80 odd people. You know, I'm not in the, in the first couple of years, I was managing the SDR team directly, but now I'm managing the, the, the people who manage the managers of that team. It's a very, very, very different job. And I've, I've had to relearn everything because of course, managing SDRs, you're managing in the in the hour, in the day, in the week, in the month, if you're lucky. Um, yeah. And you're managing emotions and you're managing, you know, the, the ebbs and the flows and, and you're managing transactionally. What was that called like? What could you have done better? You're coaching on a specific scenario. Of course, when you become strategic and, and you're in leadership, you don't influence today, you influence tomorrow. You're thinking a quarter ahead, you're thinking a month ahead. And, and, and you drive those people through data, through innovation, through, um, you know, through planning, through process, through systems, not through emotion. And that's a really interesting transition that I've had to go through. But go back to your, your, your question on the SDR piece, how do you keep them mo motivated? Do you know what? For me, when I think back about the people that have inspired me, um, managed me, got the best out of me, um, it, it's people that have always had high levels of energy, people who are positive by their nature, and people who help me up when I'm down, you know, they'll get me through this, because those are inevitable in yeah. if, if you're only prospecting. Um, but it's also people who have educated me. It's people that have taken the time to want to invest in making me better at what I do. And I think when you when you stand back and you look at those two things, an SDR, they know how to pick up the phone, right? They know how to talk to somebody. They know, well, they should do, at least in terms of basic skill sets. You, you obviously part of the education piece is to get them there in the first place. What we need to do once we've established that they've done probation, they can do the job, is make them feel as positive as they can feel at all times. Right, and it's yeah. make them feel like they want to pick up the phone, and make the next call. They want to get their transactions of their, their their activity levels high without reducing quality. Make them feel like they want to get better at their job, that they want to go and listen to content like this and podcasts and read blogs and watch videos and 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 spend time outside of work becoming the best salesperson they can be. And the only way to do that is create an environment where they love it, where they enjoy it, where they where they're challenged and when they're pushed, they they, they feel like they're learning and progressing and moving forwards. And when, you know, quite frankly, when they're on those downs, which we all get, they're pulled back up. Yeah. Um, and I think there's a real skill that is missing in a lot of SDR managers nowadays who are sat around looking at spreadsheets um, yeah. or, you know, or, or, or holding people in pipeline reviews and doing a lot of product training. And I think mm. they're missing a beat for sure. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Because it's, it's, it's hundred percent. Like I'm completely with you on the fact that like that keeping that energy level up in that room in an SDR like setup is the biggest challenge mm. and it's kind of you could say you could in a, in a way it's with with development right with the training and stuff as well like it's probably the most important element um you can sit and look at dashboards and stick your call stats on the board and whatnot yeah. And, and yeah great that tells you what's going on but I mean if you don't know what's going on without a dashboard then you're clearly not doing the job you should be uh, you should be doing right yeah. um like you should be able to get a sense of how it's going in your team without looking at stats yeah. you should know who's performing who's not because usually their energy level is, is on par with their performance right mm -hmm. yeah. Spot so, on. yeah spot on what yeah. what sort of things i'm just thinking of here as well for because i'm sure there'll be quite a lot of other team leads and sdr managers mm. or people who want to do that job as well um what, what sort of tips would you give for people uh, or, or things what you're doing right now or you've done in the past to keep that energy level up there? Of course, you've got the coaching, you've got the ongoing like, yeah. listening to calls and stuff. Do you do things like run competitions and get them to compete against each other? What what, what sort of stuff do you do? Yeah, I, I think that, yeah, that in essence, yes, is the answer. That's what we, we would do. I think um, there's a couple of pieces. One is the... 
uh, the more serious side of it, which is making sure you're coaching, making sure you're you're listening to calls, making sure you're working with them one to one, and you're giving them the basics to to make them feel like they're progressing. And, and one doesn't work without the other. By the way, I think these two things yeah. have to be happening. And all the fun, incentive-driven target stuff is lovely, but if you don't have that, it doesn't work. It, it, mm-hmm. it, it, it's it's a band aid solution. Yeah. Um, and then if you look at the the, the stuff that to, to influence what I call climate. My only, my only caveat to this would be that when I was running a, an inside sales or SDR team, we were all in the office. So the world has changed somewhat since then, naturally. So yeah. when I think about best practice, I think about what did I do to drive? At one point, I had 60, 60 SDRs, 70 SDRs over in Australia running that team. And we, you know, I was on the floor all day, every day. Um, and I was, I became the master of listening to five calls at a time, just sat in there, sat in there, just sitting in the middle of the floor, my eyes closed on my chair, just kind of roll a bit closer on my wheelie chair to whoever was talking or whatever it might yeah. be, and tune in. I, I think it's, yeah, incentives, games, it's funny what motivates people. So we used to, we used to do things like set targets. And if, if the target was hit, there would be a, a, a reward for, for people, but that wouldn't always be a financial reward. That might be that I had to do something. So it might be, it's fun stuff. It's stuff that makes them think, oh geez, this, you know, this, this, this guy, this lady, whoever it is, is they're fun to work with. They're, yeah. you know, they're prepared to put themselves on the line, prepared to, to, to make a fool of themselves. They're prepared to give us a challenge. Um, silly things, I'll give you an example. We used yeah. to have a game called Toss the Boss. Now, funny title. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it was really simple. Anytime someone booked a meeting for one of our clients, we would effectively give them five. This is Australia, so five dollars, right? So there's a there's a five dollar bonus, and they could they could take the five dollars and they could walk away. They could put it on their their pay package, and you know you might earn you might get five of those in the week, ten of them in the week, or yeah. you could gamble. And if you gambled, it was really simple: toss a coin, heads or tails. If you got heads, if you got it right, it doubled, and if you got it wrong, it went down to one dollar. We never used to go to zero because we didn't want people to get nothing because we felt yeah. that. But um, <laughs> yeah, people would gamble, and and the way that I would play that would be if they lost, I'd celebrate. I'd go, yeah, I got my money back. You know, I've only got a budget to play with, and I'd really wind them up about it and have fun with it. And if they won, I'd be really gutted and I'd be angry with them and go, oh, damn it, you got my money and all this sort of stuff. But you know what? It wasn't even about the money. It was the experience. No. It was the the fact that. You know, when they got that meeting, I knew about it. I was there on the floor with them and I'd go straight over to them as they got off the phone, pat on the back, well done, sit. I'd ask them about the meeting, tell me about it. What was it like? What, was it, what did they say? And then and then we'd do it there and then and other people would watch and it was it was fun, you know? And that's the stuff that people people go, it's funny what they'll do for, for five dollars. They'll work harder to get the next meeting. And it's not yeah. five dollars, it's the experience. And that's yeah. what work is about. So Okay, you can't do that every day, but there's, there's, you know, probably got twenty of those up my sleeve. But that's a really good example of, <laughs> of sorts of things that we would do just to keep it engaging and fun during the day. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think that's what you have to do, right? It's about it's about also doing something different because mm. people get pretty sick and tired of winning Amazon gift cards or whatever it is. Yeah. Like, and that's that's I think what a lot of companies do. They're like they try and just change what the prize is. Mm. Right, in, in a sense that okay, if not a gift card or not an iPod or whatever it's going to be, then, then what about this? Something a yeah. bit more expensive. It's like, but that's not the point, right? It's because yeah. the game got boring. Uh, exactly. They want to play it. They say they want to play a, the same game, but a different, like in a mm. different, in a different way. Or, or it's like top person gets this, and it's always the same person over and over again. Yeah. It's a big prize, and you know you can win a holiday. You you see it on job descriptions, and you can win a holiday. There's incentives, but of yeah. course, you know ninety something percent of the team can't win that or don't win that yeah. so it's irrelevant to them so m- much better to have something that's that's more inclusive you can have the big stuff as well if you want to but something that yeah as i say that's experience based that you know one of the best incentives i ever ran genuinely was when i said to my team if you do x whatever the numbers were i can't remember i'll bake a cake that's big enough for everybody now i can't bake everyone knew about that and we joked about it but i said what do you want and they said well make Baker something, I have no idea what I'm doing. So there I was at the weekend baking a massive flipping cake, which was a disaster. Quite frankly, I don't think anyone wanted to eat it. But the fact <laughs> that I spent my weekend doing that because they hit target, and the fact that they knew I would really struggle to do that, and I would, you know, I'd look like an absolute fool when I bought this thing in on Monday, meant that they weren't hard to hit it. Nobody benefited financially from that. It's part, it's, it's experience. Yeah. yeah, it's part. It's part of what makes your culture, right? Mm. 
absolutely absolutely and, and you know only that sort of stuff can come from within to some degree but only the leader or leaders can create that and really push it and yeah. you know i think i think a lack of creativity is part of the issue mm, yeah you know it's funny because well, i think one of the one of the one things what I always remember doing, and this was in my first my first telemarketing job, actually, my mm. first B2B sales role, that was donkey's years ago. Um, and I remember we used to run a competition every day where we would just have like, we'd go through the word of, words of the day. So you would have to pick, pick a, a, a half a sentence or a couple yeah. of words. And it wasn't like the first person to do that, like everybody had to do it at least once in that day. Mm. I'm like, I'm like i always remember that one because it was the so yes. much fun it was the most fun one of any of them i don't remember any of the incentive prizes mm. whatever we brought. i remember that one in particular because that yes. was just the most enjoyable right it's like right what's yeah. the word of the day today folks yeah like, right we've done it now because then it was almost like a it was good for team building as well because it was almost if four people had done it and there's one left who's not then everybody else mm. is like come on, come on get yeah. on the phone do it do it mm. So yeah. it's um, great fun. Great. and Good you know point. what's funny there is you said you remember the experience and the feeling not the prize yes exactly because there was no prize well, apart from the feeling. <laughs> the feeling was the prize <laughs> prize no, we, had to, we had to work hard we had to work hard for just salary and commission in that role the incentives were like uh, not not so uh, not so quick to the table no fair enough <laughs> ceo used to take us used to take us to the pub on a friday for lunch maybe sometimes if we did well but uh, apart yes. from that no yes. it was a good graft good graft all right so on the top on this topic again you, you you obviously already mentioned this a little bit earlier on um when it comes to culture when it comes to this kind of environment um and, and i've always been sort of somebody who's who says more than ever like for sdrs that is way more important than it is for account execs mm. um like what what how did you handle covid and and the new sort of remote working culture what what's well i'm gonna say sneaking in i'm gonna say fell <laughs> through the uh, roof um into the building Mm. How, how, yeah, how you sort of been dealing with that and handling that? Yeah, I, look, um, the one thing, again, I'll caveat it by saying I'm not sure that we're best practice. Um, and that's not to say we've done it badly, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'll share what we've done and, and where I think we've got it right and where I think we're still we're still working it out. Um, so like everybody, we went remote. It was a pretty dire two or three months um, mm. after COVID hit. I think the nature of what we do as an organization is that people spend a chunking chunk of money and it sits on the PL as one of the more, more expensive suppliers. And at a time when you're concerned about growth and investment, you know, it's one of the first things to be looked at. Uh, so you know, we were we were we were reduced or, or or stopped by a lot of our clients, some the right way in line with contracts, some not the right way. It was amazing to see how people's ethics changed all of a sudden. Yeah. Um anyway, that's another conversation naturally we went remote um we so as an organization and I'm, I'm i'm quite big on this i really believe in people being physically present with work now what that doesn't mean is that i think we should work in a world where everyone's in the office five days a week i think quite often i get mistaken for that what i do think is that 100 percent remote working is not the right thing for sdrs so we no. moved this year back to um, a mandated two days in the office so everybody's two days in the office minimum um, yep. some will come in five days and some will come in the two days and everything in between um, yep. and we're seeing an increased uptake what we've done is run a monthly or a monthly all-in day um, where everyone is in the office and 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 a bigger day on the you know, where we invest a little bit more every quarter as well and we've turned those into events they're yep. really important days where everyone's in on the same day it's you know there's no choice um, you're in and we're making the most of it um, and what a surprise that there are most productive days every single month, every single quarter in terms of meetings booked, in terms of productivity, all those sorts of things. And yeah. I think the world, it's interesting, isn't it? So, you know, I think the world has taught us in the last couple of years that we can give some flexibility. We can have some flexibility in our careers. And I think it's really important that we do. But I see organisations get we're remote first. Everyone can remote 100% of the time. I think we're letting yeah. SLs down. Early, early stage people career-wise in their early yeah. 20s who are trying to learn no longer do they have exposure to the ceo talking to them the, the, no longer do they listen to their vp of sales on the phone next to them or in meetings next to them because they've got to go and find that stuff or be given it no longer yeah. do they learn i call it learning by osmosis now do they absorb that 
that that energy and that knowledge that comes from the top performing SDRs in their team because they've got to go and find that stuff. So they're not learning by accident as we would have done. They have to learn intentionally, and we as organisations aren't very good at that. The no. big part of, of of when I think about about the SDR teams I've run over the years, the big thing I love about having everybody in one space is that people would learn without me having to teach them. They would learn by default because they were around great people, learning from other people who've done the job, and that's been taken away. And so I do worry about where our future leaders are. Where are, where's the commercial knowledge? All that stuff I learned from being thrown in at the deep end at 22, 23 years old, managing a team. I said earlier, I'm sitting there listening to five people talk on the phone at one time, and I can hear them, and I'm able to wheel over next to them and go, write something on a bit of paper, try saying this, try. To, it's all gone. You can't do that. Everything's retrospective. It's looking back and. I think we've we've been robbed of a lot of things that make being in sales great. You know, the, yeah. the highs are lower and the lows are lower when you're working at home. Um, so I'm yeah. a really advocate for being physically together, although I think it's a balance to be in home. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I guess it it creates especially with onboarding, right? And especially like you say with those those typically, you know, an SDR is your first step into sales, right? Yeah. Um, and most people, a lot of people step into it and they don't know what to expect. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if, even I noticed like in the past, like 18 months in particular, like that, that onboarding process for remote workers just becomes, you would think people would, people would actually think the opposite. They would think, oh, it's easy. You can give them everything digital, give them a course to take. You can have meetings with them every day, but it's like, well, no, because they have all of a sudden tons of questions they want answering and if you're the only person there or the only person they see as readily available they're just going to yeah. hammer you all day on slack or yeah. whatever because they're just hungry for that information mm. but it's like you say like i think most of the time especially the best salespeople in the beginning they're like sponges and mm. I, I, I again i i I did a blog about this the other day where i was like yeah, whenever people's telling you about the best people are usually talking about themselves mm. i always remember when I was like walking, set, stepping into a new job in sales, I would literally sit there, like you you literally visualized it before. I would sit there and I would just be like, I would just yeah. raise her in to these golden nuggets, what he was saying or she was saying. And, they, and, and I would just soak all of those in and I'd be just like, right, which ones of those am I using? Yeah. I'm going to apply them in my technique. And that's how you learn fast, mm -hmm. right? And it, literally within a couple of days, you can get so many golden nuggets. Mm -hmm. uh, and so so I, do, I do worry for, for onboarding. And I do worry for culture building, definitely, because yeah. SDRs need that energy. You cannot get that energy working from home. No, all. you can't. You know what? Within our business, so uh, across 2020 and 2021, we, we we embraced remote hiring. So we went, well, okay, if people are going to be remote anyway, let's hire anyway. Um, what we found, and we've got a reasonable amount of data, it's clearly not conclusive, but it's certainly clear in our business alone, is that people are twice as likely to leave during probation. Um, so you know when you look at that the cost of hire the cost of onboarding you know all that sort of stuff they were twice as likely to leave if they were 100 percent remote why because they don't understand the culture they're not engaged which is the job which is the number which is the face on a screen there's no cultural connection there's no connection to the people they're not making friends there's no loyalty outside of i do my job i get get paid i go home uh, well we were already home so that one that one doesn't work but you know that that's it but more importantly it is hard to onboard people they don't get answers to their questions they're not learning as quickly they don't get to the point where they're successful as quickly and that means they get frustrated and you know all that stuff we talked about there about listening remember that if you're on a floor of salespeople and they're all talking all the time having sales conversations and doing things you can be in a mood of not learning you know you're just not in that space today and that's okay because tomorrow you might be in a learning mood and you might really yeah. absorb things Whereas what we have to do with remote people is create a learning environment. Right now you're in learning mode, go. I'm not yeah. always in the best place to learn. And that if I'm not, that's a completely wasted hour or two. And I think that's that's the, that's the biggest downside other than the fact that you're only learning from the people who are teaching you. Whereas if you're yeah. in the office, as I say, you can you can end up stumbling into head of client strategy, VP of sales, founder, CEO, MD, chatting to them for five, 10 minutes and learning something. Gone. You don't five or ten minutes though, is it? It's usually like that five minute conversation what turns yeah. into three hours and a whiteboard mm -hmm. and like brainstorming and yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. Exactly. I, I remember it because I specifically, especially after I I think when I when I started uh, in my last role like at Ocean, like I remember I started there just as it was coming 
just getting to the back end of COVID. Mm -hmm. um, so, of course, I was working at home full time for that first hour. I, I, we'd agreed we was going to go back part time. As soon as I went back in the office on the first day, I was like, oh, I miss this. Yeah. And I was in five days a week from there on. I didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't even bother. I didn't want to sit at home and work. Yeah. Um, so, but it, and it was that I, I said the same thing there in the beginning is like, if I wouldn't have had that experience of being in the office and being able to pick the CEO's brains yeah. about the product and understanding it and all that stuff, as it, mm. it would have taken that, that would have taken me months to pick up all that knowledge. Yeah, like, none of it was scheduled meetings half of the time. I know, I know. And do you know what? The other thing, the other thing I I, I can't envisage, I could go back to when I started wearing the same team. One of the best things about that was nothing to do with work. It was the fact that I made friends. There were people there. We were similar ages. Yeah. We would go for drinks after work, and we had a culture. We had, a, we, we, you know, I've got lifelong friends from that part of life. You don't yeah. do that over a screen virtually. It's not the same. And I think people, young people, are missing out on life experiences mm. that that help make them and help help them to enjoy the career and enjoy being a part of an organisation. And and yeah. you know, is that a business's priority? No, of course it's not. But I think as an individual, I can't understand why you wouldn't want that. But that's me. No. No, that's it. But uh, everybody's everybody's different in their own way. But I think flexibility, like you said, flexibility is the probably the best thing that's come out of yeah. this. Because then companies who maybe beforehand were very rigid with that, then of course mm. now they're being forced to do so. Yeah. I believe. Yeah, there's also companies out there using it as a talent acquisition uh, feature, yeah. um, pushing it even though it's not actually true um, mm. completely. So, so, but yeah, we were uh, adapting slowly but surely. Yes. Right. My, my prediction is that in the next two years. All of these organizations that have got, oh, look, isn't it amazing that we can hire everyone remote? We get the best talent anywhere. No, you don't you just get the best talent out of the pool, people who apply for the role, just as per usual. Yeah. Um, we get the best talent wherever we want, and people get to work from what they, what they want. In the next two years, they'll start to go, oh, that doesn't work. Oh, wouldn't it be, oh, wouldn't it be good if we could get people together a bit more? And slowly it'll transition back yeah. to a happy mi middle ground. And, and my view is give people flexibility, let people have two or three days from home, two or three days in the office per week, or rotate it fortnightly or monthly, but I don't, I, I just don't think it's best practice. And I'm talking about sales, SDR primarily, um, you yeah. know, and, and in, in my world, commercial roles that feed into that because we're an SDR agency primarily, but yeah, mm. I just, uh, I, I cannot see if you work in sales, why it makes sense for you to have zero physical contact with your colleagues. I, I just no. think, I just think it's, 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 it's too big a compromise. Yeah, yeah, really big. I agree. I agree. All right. So on these SDRs, you've hired a few, maybe fired a few. <laughs> had to let them go. Uh, develop them, work with them a lot. What's the uh, what's the key ingredients you look for in an SDR when you're uh, recruiting? Um, you know what? It's it, it's a classic cliche, but I mm. still think I if I was hiring an SDR team from scratch today, I probably wouldn't even worry about skills. I probably wouldn't even worry about what they're capable of or show me that they can book a meeting. I'd be looking purely at personality, drive, um, you know, it, it, ability to take ownership of or, or the desire to take ownership of coachability. You know, yeah. I think ultimately if they're likable, easy to get on with, you know they're going to work hard and you know they're going to listen, then you can probably get something out of them if you create the right environment and give the right coaching. So. Yeah, I think, you know, my advice with SDRs and usually early stage careers, you can look for as much experience as you like. A CV is going to tell you nothing. I'm looking for personality. I'm looking for somebody that I can work with, somebody I can push, somebody yeah. who's going to take feedback on and look to change, somebody who wants to be the best version of themselves and the best that they can be. Um, yeah, I think that's that's where I would always start for an SDR role. Yeah. I suppose as well when you're hiring SDRs. I mean, I don't know what. Ex well, you just said you don't really mm. look at experience. You you're kind of almost forced to have to do that a lot of the time, right? Because yeah. your best SDRs very often come with three to six months experience, if that. Mm. Um, so they don't really have much experience to be able for you to hire them based on that, right? So it is about those those characteristics and the charisma and how they come across, right? Because you know, I, I always like have this rule about like if you switch everything else off get on get on a call or meet somebody in a physically whatnot like if they're instantly likable that's like a massive big first step yeah. right you kind of if you're instantly likable then i think that's what you're going to be like when you meet customers mm -hmm. and you speak yeah. to customers yeah. so it's like a really good instant signal if you've got that naturally then that's like such a gift 
for this kind of role, right? And it's going to get you places if, if you're obviously dedicated to it. So the rest will come afterwards. Yeah, exactly. So it's, uh, yeah, yeah. All right. So, and for these SDRs, who've worked with for a long time, you've seen how where they fail and where they fall flat on their face. Mm -hmm. um you see what, what they do best what would you what would you say if we were to wrap up here on what's your three main biggest tips for an sdr today whether they're sort of maybe think about as somebody who's starting from scratch and new mm -hmm. um somebody who's sort of middle ground been doing it for a, a couple of years and so yeah. someone who actually may be ready to take that next step and, and go mm -hmm. to that next what, what's the um, three things you'd say? yeah okay fine so my, my first thing would be take you own your development so the, the, the best salespeople I've worked with at any level have always been the people that take sales as if it's something they want to study. And I don't mean that they do that every night and it's like, you know, doing a master's degree but, or a PhD in sales, but I do mean that the, they'll consume content, they'll look for things and they'll spend their own time wanting to be the best they can be. And they'll ask feedback from people and they'll seek that feedback out because they genuinely want to be the best they can be at the job. Um, and I think, too many particularly the younger generation comes through now people will, will, will expect it's on the organization's shoulders to develop them it's on your shoulders it's your career no one else's career so that's, yeah. that's point number one point number two for me is it is don't be afraid of the phone i think we've got a generation of sdrs coming through don't touch the phone and they're afraid of it it's your best tool and it doesn't matter how many emails you want to send and how many nice pieces of sales tech you've got if you cannot use the phone effectively and you hide behind email, you will be a lesser salesperson. Um, yeah, the phone is the new fax machine, right? <laughs> yeah, um, I, I can't see, I can't see anything replacing it though. I think not now, anyway. I think you know, it's it's certainly not something that's up and coming. I think it'll always be in the mix, and yeah. you'll always need to have human conversation to sell or book meetings. Um, yeah. So there's only so many emails. So don't get me wrong. I'm not saying don't embrace other channels. What I am saying is that. We have got a generation of SDRs coming through who don't use the phone or who are scared of the phone, quite frankly. And, and as yeah. a result, they're not producing the same level of results and they're not learning skills that will help them later in their career as well. So, you know, I think that's it because you're going to have to speak to people over the phone once you booked a meeting with them. And once you, if you want to be an account exec, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like the phone yeah. is your friend when it comes to developing your skills for yeah. being an account exec. 100%. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. My third is don't yeah, be careful of the flashing light. So what I mean by that is that I think junior early stage career sales reps are by their very nature pretty ambitious and pretty 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 determined to get somewhere. And I think um, there are so many people who want to go and do something else. They want to go and be an AE. They want to be the manager. They want to be the leader in ten minutes time. And equally you know that, that that kind of short-term thinking of i need to get there now versus just stay be patient earn your stripes get the job right be good at what you're good at be great at what you're good at and then go and try something else um, yeah. versus you know getting somewhere really quickly before you've actually got great at what you're doing and i think there's a level of impatience and that that then reflects on to other things like you know sort of be careful flashing lights you know sales technology we're trying to teach SDRs to, to use eight bits of sales technology before they can even pick up a flipping phone and work out how to use their soft phone. It's, you know, we're, we're all doing it as an industry. We're following the noise. We're going, oh, what, what's cool and fashionable? Let's build a 30-step yeah. sequence to get a hold of somebody. Oh, God, let it go. It's <laughs> so frustrating. Well, well, just pick up the phone and you've got a one-step sequence, right? <laughs> this is it. And this, you know... We keep things simple because we 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 as an industry are going towards the point the, the point where we've just overcomplicated the whole process. Yeah, and I, and I think you know it, it's it's the amount of time I spend in my career now trying to just calm people down, slow down a bit. Let's get this right. Let's look at it and get it right. Let's perfect this, and then we can move on to the next thing. Versus yeah. scattergun all over the place, trying to move everywhere as quickly as we can. And not actually doing anything well and i think that 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 goes to sales leaders in terms of building a sales org and processes and a sales process um and it goes to the individual sdr as well so you know i think that i feel it be careful of the flashing lights you know i think we're kind of a bit like oh jesus there's like oh, oh let's go there oh yeah. let's go over there like <laughs> the it is long take the time to be great at something because you'll never not be great at it once you're there but if you never get there you'll never be yeah. able to go back and, and rely on that skill set yeah no that's it patience right it's patience and doing doing the traineeship if you like mm. uh, 
because there's so many so many learnings it's like we said earlier on so many learnings what you get from doing the sdr role because you are engaging every day with different people all the time learning new stuff and it's like uh, yeah most of the memories i have and things what what stick with me are usually from doing cold calling or something mm -hmm. like that they're not they're not from, they're not from doing demos that's for sure yeah 100 um, yeah. percent not from, from not yeah, from that. Agree. Agree. owen it's been a pleasure i think you've given us some good golden nuggets there which i hope uh, people will take on board for sure so uh, i appreciate you coming by and uh, maybe we can do it again another time in the future Sounds so uh, yeah so the, that's everything for today folks so uh, thanks for uh, listening or watching wherever you are on the channel and uh, of course we'll be uh, we'll be back again with some more content as uh, as soon as i get the time as i always say take care everyone